So the first question I'm going to ask is that uh, do members of the First Nations communities, uh, how do they receive the work that, uh, that you're doing, Neil? So you're kind of on the ground in that space. First Nations fisheries are not regulated the same way as the rest of the industry. Well, yeah, I mean, RJ could probably speak more to the regulatory aspect. I've, I've worked with, uh, on, on site at Oswa, which is the First Nations operated um, uh, facility. Um, I mean, they like it, of course, it provides employment and uh, it's, uh, you know, from, from what I've seen, it's a, a, I was honestly surprised when I walked into the offices to see how well run it was. It's a very organized operation. Um, it was interesting, you know, I asked about if I could see some records about phosphorus and oxygen concentrations from the previous year and then just walked over to the, the you know, wall and pulled out the binder from last year and it was all organized and in 30 seconds it could show me what the water quality data was from the previous year. Um, but I can't speak for the First Nations in general uh, in terms of uh, how, how they uh, view the operations. RJ, maybe you have that sounds like they're open to providing data and working with you though. Oh. So the way they're receiving your work is in an open and very much. Trying to give a quick answer because I'm now not known for that. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I I can tell you that again, like Neil, I can't speak on behalf of and I would dare generalize across all of Ontario's First Nations, but I, I do have to say that one thing as an industry that we are very proud of is comparing ourselves to the West Coast because there are a lot of contentious issues with the protections of the West Coast that we just do not have here in Ontario. I would say the, the reception is, is quite warm. Um, we actually have a whole one sector of both CFO, you know, MAFRA, um, and our own industry that are responding and through a, a, the First Nations funding organization, Wabatech, that are working throughout the province because we had this huge upsurge in the last, upsurge in the last couple of years of First Nations communities that want to explore what aquaculture could be for their communities, um, whether or not it follows our, our model of trout or whether or not it's exploring alternative species. I know that I just saw a little slide of workshops that have been had with First Nations communities over the last year and it's into the dozens. One of the kind of recurring questions that's come up is about um, the difference between open water, open cage, and closed cage operations. And uh, one of the first questions is kind of an economics one. Can you give us a sense of, uh, kind of the economies? Is it less expensive to run an open cage? And is that really the driver here? Or are there ways of closed cage? Um, so broadly speaking, economically, uh, a land-based a, a land flow-through farm compared to an, an operation in Ontario. Uh, a fish, uh, the same rainbow trout that would be pulled out of the market size 2.8 to 3 pounds out of, a, out of an net pen farm is going to cost three times more to grow to that size in a land-based operation. Um, in, a, in an open water net pen, the densities, the, the ability for the fish to swim around um, is, is, is so much greater and the, the fresh water is so much greater that it's actually it, it, the feed conversion ratio is part of that, but also a flow through operation has a lot of added um, inputs from labor and electricity and things like that. Um, I can only speak to those two, but I can tell you that a recirculating aquaculture, like a closed containment land base, is going to be significantly more expensive than one of those flow through farms. So, James, you probably have some thoughts on that from uh, <coughs> beyond just the straight cost. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if you were to put a farm in public waters um, and provide the, free, the, you know, the, the water, the dilution capacity for the, the wastes uh, and biological degradation of everything, if you were to pick it up and put it on land, you're adding the cost of the land, you're adding the cost to move the water to the farm, uh, you're also adding the cost to return that water back to a provincial water quality objective before it can be disposed, the treatment cost. So that starts to take into account the full treatment or the full cost of producing it. The difference between that and net pen is the subsidy, the, that, that public subsidy that Ontario ones are providing uh, to permit net pen agriculture. 
Um, are there any reliable technologies that can actually, you know, we're talking about phosphorus and scouring phosphorus. Are there any technologies, maybe James, do you have a... Yeah, uh, phosphorus removal is something that has, has certainly been researched quite a bit in the municipal wastewater field. Uh, there's uh, coagulation precipitation, uh, that can get it down to fairly low levels. Um, there's also some other novel technologies that actually try to reclaim it. Um, there's a company in Alberta actually where um, they use some electrochemical techniques. They try to get the phosphorus back out as a mineral. Uh, again, get it out of the water so we can put it back in the soils. So, but there is reliable treatment, but um, um, it's, there's a lot of room for improvement still. Okay, and again, I think this impacts on something that was put into uh, a tweet or a post that went out on nearshore phosphorus levels versus offshore phosphorus levels. And, and Neil, maybe just the research, uh, you went through the slide fairly quickly, but the, the, the Cisco picking up the nutrients and taking it into the pelagic zone as opposed to the nearshore. Can you maybe just speak a little bit more about that while I pick up my notes? Um, yeah, so in, I mean, in any uh, aquatic, aquatic ecosystem, in a lake, your nearshore nutrient concentrations just by nature being in contact with the sediment, you'll probably have uh, higher nutrient levels. Um, the placement, the Depot Harbor study, and Depot Harbor is one site, um, but in that site, the nutrients or the energy subsidy, at the very least, was carbon and nitrogen, but that's all packaged together in the organic material with phosphorus, um, was being detected in open water fish and not your near shore fish. Um, this year, when we did these studies, uh, that was just looking at perch uh, and Cisco. This year, we sampled everything we could from the near shore and the offshore. We haven't got those results yet, but the initial study looked like, for de and uh, Depot Harbor, or Depot Island is a, um, it's a deeper site, um, so, but it is kind of closer to the shore, so, uh, but it's, it appeared that things were, were picking up offshore. Um, I just wanted to throw in too, um, uh, I really appreciate you, Jim, bringing up um, the cloche. Um, that was definitely a big learning lesson, not just for our industry, but also for the government ministries that were part of that project. Um, I, I, something I, I always like to say is that it, as, a, as, a, as an industry, as net pen farm operators in Georgian Bay, it is in our best interest to continue our excellent stewardship of the Bay waters. Um, why? Because A, it's the right thing to do, but also B, um, if we do put sites in locations like the Clash that don't have the flushing or more enclosed, um, and all the farms that I, that I showed you up there, uh, the green ones, they are in the open waters. They, uh, there is a stream that's it's very, very, very different than um, say something like the Clash. Um, the reason that we want to put our sites out in places like that is because if we do put them in those enclosed spaces, like we learned, quickly um, the added phosphorus and, and things like that can cause the oxygen levels to plummet, which cause our feed conversion ratios to soar. And if anybody uh, knows the way around a balance sheet, if your most expensive input, the feed, if you need two times as much, all of a sudden it becomes significantly more expensive for the same pound of, of fish. So I just wanted to make sure I, I highlight that. <coughs> you know, there was one question about uh, other things that you measured. Oh, I'm doing it again. It's my way to find out all the questions. Yeah. Um, but it's about whether you measured oxygen at uh, Depot Harbor um, with the view of the slide that James showed where, you know, in the ice you can see kind of bubbling methane or whatever it is that's coming up out of the... Is there anoxia happening in the Depot Harbor area or not? Did, were you measuring that? Thanks. Um, yeah, so you do, you do get decreased oxygen concentrations directly underneath the pen. Um, we only measured it at one point this summer, uh, just because that piece of equipment is in high demand in our, um, and what we found is you, that that oxygen concentration increased in anywhere between 75, 70 to 70, or 70 to 100 meters away from the pen, your oxygen concentrations were background. So there's a footprint and there's definitely anoxia happening, um, but at this point it seems to be you know, you get 100 meters away and then you're at background levels. So there's an area of impact, that, or a radius of impact, if you will. Then. Yes. When the um, study was, the study that was done in, in uh, 1999, I think there was a 
250 uh, hectare area that was anoxic. The last time we had our scientists on site of GBA was in 2000. And the question I have is, is, is it recovered? And I don't know if, if the MOE can answer that, but that is a very valid question. And, and that actually raises a good point, because one of the first things that we did with Guelph when we started to say what to be, what, what actually the GBA came to GBF and said, can you guys do something on agriculture? We need to understand what's going on. And, and so we then went and said, well, what do we know and what don't we know? And it was just a synthesis of all of the research that occurred you know, around the world. And I think this has been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, there's a lot that we don't understand. And secondly, there were some changes to the way the industry was formulating feed and things like that that we don't know if that had a positive impact or a negative impact, basically, from an external perspective, right? And so I think there is still a lot of research that needs to be done on that uh, scientifically. Uh, we have that one. Um, Can I ask a question? I'm sure. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Thanks for letting me come in here. <laughs> Did you write one down too, Claudia? No, write I one. didn't get a chance to write so one if I, down. So if you haven't written that, could you write it so that I can put one too? Afterwards. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. My question is, uh, we heard from experts this morning on climate change and, um, and microplastics, and they projected into the future what all this would mean into the future. Uh, we're drinking, we're eating plastics, and climate change is undeniable. With that are the storms, and my understanding of phosphorus is that the storms will kick up the phosphorus that is now contained on the bottoms under the cages. Uh, University of Guelph and the Ontario Agriculture Association, have you projected far enough? I mean, if there are any First Nation people here, we know about the seven generations. Have you projected into the seventh generation into what this will all mean, this public subsidy of our waters? And if I can add to that just before you take an answer on it, if the water temperature is increasing by four or five degrees, you know, what is that going to do to cold water species and you know, does that change growth and things like that too? So there's a lot of climate change impacts that are coming that, uh, you know, need to be considered. Is the industry considering those scientifically? And, and Jim, if you have anything to add? Yeah. You, you can okay. So I would say that, that, that Claudette expressed one of our greatest concerns, is that this is a complicated system, and it's, it's hard to predict exactly how it's going to emerge in the future. We do, know, we do know certain facts. Again, high level systems, you know, phosphorus in the environment tends to stay. Um, Generally, I, I believe it was accepted amongst the environmental and scientific community that it is a good thing to prevent phosphorus inputs into, into, into fresh water. Generally, that's a good thing. Um, the IGC has even sort of stated uh, objectives in terms of what they would like. We've invested a ton of money to take phosphorus out of our wastewater, recognizing there's atmospheric deposition, there's leaf litter, and there's rivers, and there's aquaculture, and there's septic tanks, and there's all these inputs for phosphorus. I think as a society, we have to go back and revisit, you know, do we, do we still want to maintain preventing phosphorus input into a freshwater body is a good thing. Um, and if, if, we, if we all agree that yes it is, then what can we do collectively to reduce that? Now, you know, aquaculture may have a, a piece of that. May, may, may be a, 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 it could be entitled to a piece of it. The sizing, you know, if you put a, a cage in a closed area and it quickly becomes eutrophic and it becomes unpalpable, you can't swim it or drink it. Um, if you move it in freshwater, then it's acceptable. What that literally means, that citing criteria means, is that you're flushing it away. You're using dilution as the solution. Right? And it's, it, again, we're just going back to that same principle that I thought we'd all agreed was something we wanted to, you know. You know. So I would say that without knowing full certainty, uh, at the high level systems level, we should move cautiously. And, and that is why we kind of advocated not to take farms away from existing farmers, but to really slow down and make sure we understand it. And there's just still a bunch of question marks. Um, I uh, thank you for that. I, from a from a, a phosphorus in, phosphorus inputs um, point of view, um, I do just want to highlight that it's directly there on Environment and Climate Change Canada's website that the incredibly low phosphorus levels in Lake Huron 
um, are what they blame for the decline in wild crayfish stocks since 1972. So I do just want to highlight that although we can look at pictures of Lake Erie and, and worry that that's going to happen uh, to Lake Huron, we are so far from that wherever the phosphorus is coming from. Um, it is, uh, I've heard it bounce between being called oligotrophic, meaning very nutrient uh, deficient, to ultra oligotrophic, being extremely nutrient deficient. So that I, I just want to make sure that, that uh, Lake Huron Bay, as long as they are in more of the open water like we have with our existing farms, um, it is just, it is a, like I said, it's a, it's a very different ballgame. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight too is that the aquaculture licenses for the existing farms um, are up for renewal in 2020, and we as an industry have lobbied to standardize and greatly increase the standards of those licensing conditions. They are actually following the BAP uh, model, the things that, we, that the BAP certification are asking. We are lobbying to inject into those because we want standardized licensing conditions on existing sites and any new sites. And those things include um, a better uh, set of sediment uh, modeling, um, uh, 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 an understanding of with, uh, the boundaries of where of those farms exist. These are things that we are, are, are working with Ministry of Natural Resources, with MOE, with the federal DFO researchers to better understand um, so that um, we, we, we are truly thinking far beyond um, our returns of the year. Sorry, I'll just quickly answer your question. No, we haven't done the projections, um, but the, the issue is uh, what would we base those projections on? Is it status quo? Is it improvements that we would see? Is it, uh, I think what we need to do is do the research where we show what the variability is among the different operations and where they're placed, how they feed, how they harvest, and what, what managerial uh, approaches minimize the loss of phosphorus to the sediment. Um, and then we can start to make the projections from that. <clears throat> so we're now going to be at the end of the, uh, the time for our discussion. If you haven't had your question, I think I ran through these again. Most of the questions that were asked at the tables have been answered. Is there one last question that hasn't been? Go ahead. I've got a question from the consumer's perspective. Since you're doing all this research and studying fatty acids and so on and so forth, when I approach a counter at a retail store, I'm looking at two things. I'm looking at farmed and I'm looking at wild. I tend to go to the wild because I don't know what the farms are eating and I don't know then what I'm eating. Would you suggest there's a huge difference between wild and farmed for us consumers? And organic. <laughs> and the third one is organic. I, yeah. I, I really wish there was a simple answer to that question. Um, and really the only thing I can direct towards is certifications. So there, uh, I, I, we could talk through several scientific studies that show um, wild and farm diets. Um, arguably, as someone who, like I said, fish farming runs in the blood, I have more confidence in what a farmed fish is eating and the inputs to a farmed fish than I do for a wild, and there are lots of studies um, outside of the freshwater ecosystems to back that up. Um, um, but the, 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 the advice that I always have, it's not farm versus wild, it's looking for some sort of certification. The two that I recommend are the Atlantic Stewardship Council or the Marine Stewardship Council, once wild, once farm, or the BAP certification, best agriculture practices. The other thing I think we found out a couple of years ago when we were talking, uh, and Guelph was talking about the DNA barcoding, uh, and Kevin, is what the fish is labeled as and what it actually is can be completely different things too. And if you do a genetic sample of it, you might find what's labeled as tilapia it actually isn't, or vice versa, right? So, yeah. yeah. Did you want to see um, something? Yeah, just a, I don't know what I'm getting myself into with this new research program we have, uh, hopefully coming through with Weston, but we have the Aquaculture Stewardship Council and we have, I want to say ocean-wise, is that the West Coast one? Uh, yes, the yeah, Vancouver Aquarium. Yeah, the yeah. Vancouver Aquarium, ocean-wise, on that panel to kind of represent consumers uh, on that side as to what's sustainable and what, you know, because they're the ones that put those little stickers on to say, you know, this is sustainable and, and that type of uh, thing. So we'll see how that all unfolds. Thank you. Good.
Yep. Perfect. So the GBVR just recently published in the state of the bay that the phosphorus levels in the drain in the open water is significant. I think it was mentioned briefly. It's, it's very low, impacting the zooplankton, uh, which is going to have an impact on the fish. You know, so the question is, okay, so if there's phosphorus levels that are too high in the near waters versus the phosphorus levels in the open water is too low, what are the implications of that? Do we understand why the phosphorus levels are too low? So part of, part of the reason for that is the dry seeded mussels that are down at the bottom are basically uh, causing a dead end in the way that nutrients transport themselves through the system. There's something called the benthic shunt where the nutrients that get into the bottom waters end up kind of moving up through the food web and into the near shore. And that's actually been stymied by the, the trillions of actual quagga mussels that are down at the bottom of the, uh, the lake now. So that's, I think, on the offshore, the, suspect, uh, the suspected mechanism for phosphorus sequestration out there. That isn't occurring in the near shore. And, and somebody mentioned in their experience of uh, the water, I think, James, it was you getting your feet all cut up from the zebra mussels. The zebra mussels need hard rock in order to adhere to them. The quagga mussels that are, look similar, but, uh, but they don't need the hard rock. And they uh, can go into the muck and the sands in the bottom, and they can also live a lot deeper. Where the zebra mussels are kind of in the top 70 meters, the quagga mussels can go down 200 meters. So if you look at the bottom of the lakes right now, there's way more mussels than you've ever seen that used to be on the rocks of the shore, but they're just down in the bottom of the lake now. And the, the quagga mussels have outcompeted the zebra mussels for all of those nutrients. And uh, if anybody's heard the Arunas Liskauskas from the MNR Upper Great Lakes Unit talk at uh, any of these kinds of events, Arunas has described the offshore waters of Georgian Bay right now as a biological desert. The dipariah, the, 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 the little kind of crustacean that feeds the shrimp, doesn't have any food. The, the zebra mussels and the quagga mussels have filtered it all out, and that's causing real kind of difficulties out there. So. Um, the other thing I'll just plug for is some First Nations traditional environmental knowledge uh, piece. The Chippewa of Nawash First Nation shared a long time ago, back in about 2012 when the IJC was going around with the Upper Great Lakes study, that their elders remember a time when the lake level in the bay uh, would actually rise because the lake trout were chasing the herring in, and all of that biomass coming into the water would actually cause the water to bulge. And they remember when the sturgeon were eating cranberries off of the bushes along the shore. Um, just a totally different way of looking at Georgian Bay. We are now looking at, from a biomass perspective out there, about 1% of the fish that used to be in Georgian Bay. So we have a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of uh, productivity that could go on out there. One of the other questions was things like that. What, how do you know, native trout and escapees that come out of the, uh, the facilities, how do they compete, what are the interactions there? We'll continue to try to answer those questions and provide um, some more articles and posts and things like that and get the information out. If you haven't had your question answered, as I said, feel free to email us. Um, you can email me, my email address is real easy, ed for executive director at gbf.org. Just send your questions and we'll endeavor to kind of go out and uh, answer those. But thank you very much to the panel today. Thank you.